Happy Sunday. We are in the middle of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and we want to continue with the preaching along the thoughts of the Apostle Paul. And I entitled this morning's sermon Crazy because it's uh, from one of the verse, verse 13, I believe, where the Apostle Paul talked about how if we are beside ourselves. Now remember the background of this particular series of preaching. The Apostle Paul was writing to a church that he started in the city of Corinth and it's a very messy place where the very cosmopolitan, all kinds of religion, center of commercial activity, a lot of different interpretation of the Bible and also many different kind of spiritual leaders, uh, all kinds of preachers, professional religious people appearing to challenge the authority of the Apostle Paul and his other co-workers. So you, you notice he always used the word we, meaning that he just don't talk about himself, you know, but the whole team of people. So let's quickly review what was taught last week because it's a continuation of the thought from last week's lesson. Uh, in fact, the whole letter is, is one whole flow of continue, uh, continuing thought. Last week was uh, the earlier set of verse in 6 to 10. I entitled it Sightless. And uh, I, I preach it from the back, right, from verse 10 onwards, because it first talks about the final judgment. Uh, this is also something that Paul is thinking about today, in today's particular focus uh, passage. The Apostle Paul was describing a kind of common cultural expression in the entire world. The concept that after you die, there will be some kind of a judgment. And I told you about the different religion, having different ideas, especially the Chinese religion. Those of us who are familiar with Chinese culture know that there are supposed to be 18 levels of hell. And I show you how in Singapore you can go to Hopa Villa and uh, take a good look at it. It's, it's right there. And all kinds of uh, different prescriptions for being punished. Uh, for example, if you abuse books, you will be... What was it? I can't, uh, yeah, saw into two, you know, if you abuse book and you waste food, you know, that kind of thing. So you go to Hopa Villa on the West Coast today, you can find some of these concepts from local superstition mixed with Hinduism, Taoism, all kinds of things. So the key is that in a general revelation that God has given to us, everybody sort of sense that there is a final judgment to come. But nobody really knows what that's all about. So in ep- almost every single major faith, they try to be very detailed as to exactly what will happen. It may surprise a lot of people that the details of the final judgment, and as preached before, the details relating to heaven, the new earth, the new heaven, are not very explicit in the Bible, meaning the Bible doesn't give a very big kind of a description or very detailed description. Uh, and actually, it's, it's the other way around. So therefore, anyone who gives you a very detailed description of what the new heaven and new earth will be about, or what will happen to you exactly step by step, something is not very right. Because God in his wisdom did not want to reveal all these fine details to us. But there are already some things that we definitely, absolutely know that we can cling on to. And I've preached this before to you, that this is a very interest, important general principle of the Bible, that it is true that there are many things we do not understand. Right? This morning, I don't know whether you know it, you read the newspaper, there has been a massive avalanche in uh, Sichuan, and it goes to my heart because I did earthquake relief work in Chengdu before for many years. And one whole village was buried, you know. And it's like 120-something people disappeared. And one of the episodes in there was very frightening. That there's a girl who is buried about 5 meters from the surface of the earth. And this just happened yesterday. And through a handphone, she was able to talk to the rescuer. And the rescuer asked her to hold on, you know. Don't, don't be frightened, we are coming to you. But because it's so deep, by the time they reached her, she was dead. And you can imagine, they, they were talking to her and the phone died off. And so in situation like that, you ask yourself, how does this work? Where is God? And where is God when suffering happened and all that? So sometimes you get very confused and you get discouraged because you don't have the answer. But one of the important biblical principles is that you must hold on to what you already know in the Bible. So all the, the very important teachings of the Bible that we already know and you need to have faith in those important principles because we acknowledge that we don't know everything but at the same time what we already know is more than sufficient for us in the matters of life and faith. So what do we we already know about the final judgment? It includes things like the final judgment is not escapable, not possible. The Bible tells us that every single person will die and after you die you will be judged 
And not only that, the Apostle Paul says that we are going to be before the throne of the judgment seat of Christ, meaning that Jesus Christ is the final judge. So that we already know. And because you know that Jesus Christ is going to be the final judge, you know that his judgment cannot be wrong. It cannot be biased. It cannot be unfair. It cannot escape the slightest detail. It cannot be that he can be bribed or, or he will bribe someone. So, so all this fairness thing completely is not an issue. So to put it in a nutshell, he cannot possibly make a mistake. And so therefore, last week I was encouraging you to remember that whatever injustice that you find in life, including the Sichuan situation this morning, when we finally see God, we will get the answer. And the answer will be one that satisfies us fully. It is not possible for us to stand before the final judgment or the final throne of God to then say that, I don't think this is fair. This is not right. I don't believe in it. It cannot be. Because at that time, Jesus will be proclaimed as Lord of all. Every tongue confess and every knee shall bow before our Lord Jesus Christ. Meaning that we will absolutely, completely surrender to the wisdom of God. Now, I also point out to all of us that although the final judgment is not escapable, there are two different kinds of judgment, generally speaking. Believers face the judgment of rewards. And so if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you need not fear the final judgment because we face the judgment of rewards, whereas non-believers face the judgment of sin. So all the whatever attribution or punishment that we think about associated with sin applies to the non-believers only. Because for those who follow Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ has took on the punishment of sin already. And so while we all will face the final throne, believers face it with joy and with hope. And because of that, the Apostle Paul wrote that we are of good courage. So he's writing, you know, we, so we start with verse 10 of final judgment and verse 6 says, because of that, we are of good courage. So despite of all the challenges that he has gone through, he was a person that was dynamic and was positive and was happy, was joyful. And here we see another description, he was of good courage. And then Paul says that although I'm willing to be with the Lord right now where I am, we walk by faith and not by sight. And this was a difficult verse to really want to talk about in detail. So I used John chapter 11 as a, a kind of a sounding board for the understanding of faith. John 11 is the chapter of the resurrection of Lazarus. And I love that particular chapter because it's a historical chapter. It actually shows us what happened when we face issues relating to life and death. The, the things that Jesus Christ knew as God versus the things that we know as human beings was completely displayed in chapter 11. The difficulty of us trying to understand, trying to put faith in God is completely demonstrated in John chapter 11. As Jesus was teaching Mary and Martha about life, about him being the resurrection and the life, they all of them just don't get it. And so from there, there are many important lessons. The summary understanding is that we therefore need to know the Word of God well, and we need to have faith in the Word of God and most importantly, we also need to obey the Word of God. And the Apostle Paul reflecting then on how his final life, and that's the case for all of us, will ultimately be in the hands of God and his final judgment, then say whether we die or we live, we aim to please God, no matter what the situation is. And I ended the sermon by routing back to the Westminster Declaration that the purpose of our life is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And so again, the verse, focus verse for this morning linked back to the earlier verses. Verse 11 said, Therefore, so because of what he has said before, final judgment, all these things about how we want to please God, therefore, then the whole set of teaching uh, follows from there. Let's come to God in a word of prayer and commit the time into his hand as we enter into this new set. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for calling all of us here this morning. We do pray that the Holy Spirit enlighten us, that we may be awakened from our slumber, that our eyes may be opened, our spirit made humble. For the Bible says that God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Let us be like a little child before his heavenly Father, willing to listen, willing to obey. Have special mercy on your unworthy servant. May the words of his mouth and the meditation in all our heart and mind be deemed acceptable in your sight, for you are our God and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now remember, the Apostle Paul just spoke 
the verse right before that was the verse about the final judgment. So there's going to be a final judgment. Life is not a whole series of coincidental event and then finally you just die in the middle of nowhere and the whole thing has no meaning. The Apostle Paul says there's going to be a final judgment and that you will be made accountable for things that you have done in this lifetime, whether it's good or bad. And remember once again, that for Christians, whatever the case may be, you are never good enough. And so Jesus Christ took on the punishment for us. So we need not fear the final judgment. However, there is still a sense that we need to be accountable. So in verse 11, the Apostle Paul continued the trend of thought by declaring, Therefore, because of what I wrote before, because of final judgment, because that one day we could be whole, held accountable to God, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. So here he used the word fear of the Lord. But what we are is known to God, and I hope is known also to your conscience. The second part of the verse means that the Apostle Paul was trying to say that, you know, I'm a preacher together with my team of workers. We come to you and we preach to you. We are the real deal. But the reason, be before, the reason why we persuade others, the reason why we work so hard, the reason why we come to the church of Corinth to keep telling you about the gospel of Jesus Christ, one of the reasons is knowing the fear of the Lord. I want to be very clear that sometimes we are stuck by the language Use because I'm bicultural, I know the Chinese translation immediately, and there are differences, you know. And that's why in the Reformed Evangelical understanding, it's always the original word that is most important. We always go back to the original Greek to get the final meaning. And even the original Greek is stuck because it's a human language. So many things associated with God, we find it difficult to understand. And one of the good ways to understand is to look at different languages, check back the original language to find out what it means. The fear of the Lord is a word that sounds scary because of the word fear. But in a better understanding, is the word reverential awe. And even that doesn't quite explain it. The Chinese word that is used is jing wei. Jing wei means jing is a form of respect. But way is a form of fear, being frightened. And so reverential awe is more or less the correct understanding. And the Bible understands the fear of the Lord in this way. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, plainly declare, For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. And so without a doubt, the Bible does teach that there is such a thing as the fear of the Lord. I think Singaporeans understand fear a little bit better than other people, I think. The fear of certain authority, because we live in a very authoritarian kind of a society for a long time. And the recent uh, family problem uh, show us that the subsequent impact is still to be realized. That we are very confused when we see all the Lee people fight each other. And I keep explaining to my family that it's quite an interesting thing because they are fighting of the most highest elite. There are at least four president scholars inside there because the PM and his wife are both president scholars and then his two siblings are president scholars too. And then one of the in-laws is the second Asian in history to receive double first honours from the University of Cambridge. And that's the daughter-in-law. And guess who was the first? The first was Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. So it's like, you know, all the top brains. So it's like the best fighting fish you have, you put in a tank and watch them fight. And you see what happened. But there are a lot of confusion, as you can see. And one of the reasons is because for the longest time, rule of law in Singapore is a very strange thing because it's very hard to know whose law is the rule of law. And so now it's being exposed slowly and it gets very frightening. And one of the illustrations I keep giving uh, cannot help but give it again because it's the best illustration I've seen to illustrate how Singaporeans really have a latent fear of authority to the extent that it's quite ridiculous. As many of you know, I do run a marathon and one of the hardest things to do in running a marathon is not the marathon itself, is to find time to train for the marathon because if you want to run a decent marathon at my age, you should try to achieve five and a half hour below kind of a thing, right? I mean, you can walk the marathon and finish in 12 hours, but that's meaningless. So in order to reach that kind of timing, you need to find time to train. If you're going to run a five and a half hour kind of marathon, surely you've got to run in at least four hours, I suppose, in one of your training sessions. So you can imagine in the day, how do you do that? So one of the ways is do it early in the morning because, you know, 
other than that, you really don't have the time. So there was a period of time they will wake up at 4, 4.30 to, to run. And, you know, at that time, the road is completely empty. And I live in Yochukang. It's this very, very long Yochukang road. And you just run all the way to the end and you run back. You run a few times, you will probably hit three, four hours. And I remember one time at 4.30 in the morning, I was hitting the road and it was like completely empty. I was running and running and running. And I bypassed a traffic junction. And there was a guy standing at the traffic junction, and I ran by him. And as I was running, I kept thinking to myself, hey, something is wrong. It's 4.30 in the morning, that guy is standing in the traffic junction. It cannot be that he's waiting for the light to turn red, right? And you know what I did? I actually turned around and ran backwards. You know what running backwards means? So that I can see what he's doing. True enough, he was waiting for the traffic light to turn red before he crossed the road. At 4.30 in the morning, when both sides of the roads are completely empty, this Singaporean guy is standing there, ting, 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 and then he wait for the light to turn red. I love this illustration because I always like to poke at all the senior government officials that I've met. One day I will ask the minister the same question. The question is, is this guy a good Singaporean or not? Is he a good citizen? What do you think? Yes or no? Is he a good citizen? The Indonesians say, no, of course not, like you're Indonesians, you know. I tell you, most of the time when I ask civil servants, they all say, yes, of course he's a good citizen, because he's law-abiding. Now, I have suspect that the guy at 4.30 in the morning at Yochukang Road probably think that there's some government people hiding in a bush somewhere. Once I cross the road, he'll kind of give me a jaywalking ticket at 4.30 in the morning. It's a really weird thing, isn't it, to, to see this. And I tell you, such illustrations are everywhere. And, and everywhere I go, I see the same thing. Even broad daylight, there's no car whatsoever. People stand out there and wait for the light to turn red. I'm not suggesting that you should break the law. Huh? I'm just saying that this is something you need to think about. And this is why every time I go to Jakarta for our meeting, you know, our church has a 24-story building there, and one of the floors is a dorm, 17-story. I love to go to the window and look at the Jakarta traffic. It's like Bo Zhenghu, right? Chinese say. And then oh, wow, they go here and there, and there's a cruise cross here, and then this guy suddenly appears, stop everybody, and let the other car pass, and then he can collect money. That, I, I keep wondering, how does the system work? Who is in charge, you know? Is, is there a taxation thing? You know, it's a very Singaporean thing, right? You know, surely government should move in, right? So the fear of the system is inherent in a lot of us. And su I suppose because of that, for the longest time, we look at societies all over the world as it moves towards a more democratic system, especially with the proliferation of social media. You do see a trend of countries being liberalized, so to speak, everywhere. In Asia, the closest example would be Taiwan, which is likely to be the first Asian city to legalize same-sex marriage. And so they pride themselves as being liberalized. And I tell you, the impact is very strong because it moves into faith as well. And there seems to be a concerted effort worldwide to sort of make God a friendly person because the idea of fear of God seems to be very outdated. So you see in the illustration, all faith seems to be taking along that kind of a, a trend, you know, from the Christian to your the Titan year to a very friendly Jesus Christ and mythology. And even in India, there is a cartoon series called The Young Krishna, which is the idea of the, the Krishna as a, as a child. So it's, it's a cartoon series. I have actually seen it when I was in India, in Mumbai, and, and it's like a typical cartoon and so your God is now portrayed as friendly next door neighbor kind of a guy and certainly in many of the church movement today even in Singapore the idea is to encourage congregation to think of God as your friendly next door guy where you look at him and say hey what's happening give me five kind of thing because God is your friend and and he's, he's very kind to you and he will be very nice to you. He's very forgiving, you know, do whatever you want. And, and not like a party guy, like, you know, like party Jesus Christ kind of, kind of thing, you know. You, you are a good friend to him. I want to be very clear about this. This sort of teaching, while the, I suppose some of the intention is good, so that you don't think that God is very fearful. Some of the major faith re retain that aspect, right? Islam, for example, has the aspect of God being really, really fearful. So if you look at the illustration, you will not find an illustration of Allah or Muhammad, the prophet. You try to do that and you see what happened to you. To, you, to them, that's blasphemy because it's, it's not to be 
don't play play you know it's you you it's a terrorist thing it's it's a frightening thing because the fear of god and the reverence fear of god for them is at such a height that no illustration no no joke you really really are very careful with that and people try to move away with that but let me be very clear that it's not just a a question of teaching actually it is actually a question of the qualitative difference between God and us. In other words, even though you think that God is your friendly next door neighbor, does not make him so, you know, because there is a qualitative difference between who God is and who we are. And the two examples that I use often is the example of Isaiah and John. The Bible recorded two cases of two persons in two era who came to close proximity with God. One was a prophet Isaiah, who was from a very royal family, well taught, and he served God in one of, one of the most major prophets in the Old Testament. So in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah wrote that, I, In a year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each has six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, two he flew. So that's a vision that he saw. And one called to each other saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And so the song we sing, Holy, 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 you know, inspired by verses like that. And the foundation of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Now remember, Isaiah was a great prophet, very close to God. He understood God very well. And his books, he was given the privilege of understanding the prophecy relating especially to Jesus Christ. And so the book of Isaiah is very long, a lot of prophecy inside about Jesus Christ. And what happened when he came close to God? Verse 5, And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. In other words, he was frightened when he came into close proximity with God and the glory of God was witnessed by him. And he said, my goodness, I'm going to be dead because I am an unclean person. So a prophet who was so close to God, who knew God so well, who was given the privilege of prophecy about our Lord Jesus Christ, when he came to close proximity with God, he was frightened and the fear of God overwhelmed him. The other example is the Apostle John. You know about John. John is the, was the youngest among all the apostles and he considered himself the most beloved apostle of Jesus Christ. He said that Jesus loved him the most. Maybe it's because he thinks Jesus loved him the most. Uh, you, it, biasness is, is, a, is a terrible thing. Uh, see what happened to the Lee family. All because... Your father gives the number one son the house and everything starts from there. So all you parents, don't be biased. So, so John thought that Jesus is biased for him. Uh, the Bible never confirmed it, uh, by the way. And anyway, he lived the longest, wrote the Gospel of John, and also Revelation, the last book of the Bible, where he was given the privilege of seeing the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. So Revelation is about the future, the vision of the future. He made it known by sending his angels to his servant John, and that's himself, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. So that's Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. And then he described the things he saw. And in verse 12, he said, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstand, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. And then he went on to describe how glorious the Son of Man uh, is, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ appearing to him. And so this apostle who was closest to Jesus, who loved, who think that Jesus loved him the most, and who during the crucifixion of Jesus was the only one who stayed, you know. Everybody ran away. In Hokkien, it's called Siam Gabehu. That means they all run, 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 and run away because they were all so frightened. And John loved Jesus so much that he actually was the only one who stayed there. So he was the one who was really, really close to Jesus Christ. And now in a final revelation, he saw the image of Christ in his glorified form. Verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. So, a great prophet, great apostle. In their lifetime, they did so much for God and they loved God so much. And yet, when they came to the close proximity 
of the presence of God. They fell as if dead. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, do not think that when you see God, you can say, how are you? What's happening? Give me five. Because long time no see. It's not because God wants to frighten you or whatever. And it's consistent in the Bible, right? Last week I told you, every time in the Bible someone meet God or meet the messenger of God, the first thing the messenger of God will always say is, do not be afraid. Do not, fear not, do not be afraid. I don't know whether angels are very ugly or whatever, but it's, it's all inspiring and all of a sudden you realize that, hey man, I'm actually a, a, a not so good a person. Huh? Then quickly think, what's the last sin I, I, I commit? Better confess now before I go and meet God. Because there is a qualitative difference. That's why in the morning when before worship service, we do the ACTS prayer, we say adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. Adoration means you adore God. You, you recognize God for who He is. And then immediately confession. Because like all these people, you know, immediately you realize, oh my, I better make sure that, you know, I, I, my confidence is restored. It, it's not that God will not forgive you. We believe that when God forgives, He forgives us completely. And we are not encouraging you to keep confessing the same sin over and over again. But the problem is not with God, the problem is with us. We lack that faith to understand that we are completely forgiven and we continue to sin. Christians are not sinless, they just sin less. And so we do want to acknowledge that we, were, we have fallen and we want to come back to God. And so therefore, never ever think that God should be taken lightly for granted. It is absolutely true that in the Bible, Jesus Christ proclaimed us as his friends. But remember that just because Jesus proclaimed you as his friend does not mean that you will not need to have a healthy fear of him. And so the Christian pastor Francis Chan said, it is pretty crazy task to try to describe God quickly. So some people think that God is so simple. Uh, in Chinese, it's san yan liang yu. I just explained to you uh, four spiritual law, one, two, three, four, five, six, okay, finished, the whole thing is finished. It cannot be. And so Francis Chan said, everything starts with a healthy fear of him. And indeed, it is true that we need to have a healthy fear of God. So the Apostle Paul says, why do we do this? Why do we persuade you? And he started off by telling you, because of the fear of the Lord. It is true that in the Bible, there are many parables that describe along that line that God has given all of you a lot of gifts. The parable of the steward talks about how with the gift that God has given to us, we need to be responsible for it. And one day, God will hold you accountable. And you need to have a healthy fear of that and don't take it for granted. So whatever gift that God has given to you, remember there is a accounting for it. I know that I preach that Christians look forward to the judgment of reward. So some people may say, oh, happy, home safe. I don't need to do anything anymore. I'm not sure whether it's so simple. I don't know what the judgment of reward really means. Again, the Bible is not very clear. But I know it must make a difference. I, I don't know what does that mean when you face God and you realize that you have not done anything with your life. What does that mean? Will you be malu in front of the whole millions of people? Is that how it works? I don't know. But it must mean something. And so I always say that this is like the Spider-Man principle, right? To whom which more power is given, more what? Responsibility has to come. So every single one of you seated here are privileged people because God has put you in Singapore. And this is a privileged place. So you have been given a lot, a lot, a lot more than the, some average human being in this entire world. And so God will hold you accountable and you need to have the healthy fear towards that. And verse 12, the Apostle Paul continued to say, We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearances and not about what is in the heart. The Apostle Paul here was referring to the many false teachers who were challenging him constantly. So remember when he was writing, he, he bugs him a lot because there were many people there who keep trying to destroy the work that he do. And he said, these are false teachers and earlier preaching, we already went into detail about this. But here, interestingly, he talked about teachers who put a lot of emphasis on outward appearances. Sadly, today is still the case for us in our world today. There are many people who are people who put emphasis on our appearances. Uh, including church leaders, right? A whole bunch of people preaching prosperity gospel, telling you that 
The way to see yourself being blessed by God is by the hour appearances. Do you have a bigger house? Do you have a bigger car? Do you have a, a jet that is your own? Do you have yacht? Do you have horses? And these are our appearances. And there are pastors out there that tell you that this shows that God blessed me. Blessed me a lot. You know, it, it was really quite crazy. When I was studying as a university student in Texas, there was a Hindu guru whose specialty is Rolls Royce. <laughs> he collects Rolls Royce. He had 98, I believe, Rolls Royces. So his people would collect money and buy him a Rolls Royce. See, a Rolls Royce, a pink in color with flamingo on it and, and what have you. And this guru preaches free love. So his concept is free love. I, but one something, something, I can't remember his name. And, and that was his thing, you know. And his devotee gave him a lot of money and he's like, wow, 99, 98, 99 Rolls Royces. And today is the same thing. I've heard pastors in Singapore who say that you need a prosperous saviour to give you prosperity. And so they argue that Jesus Christ was very rich uh, because being rich means that you are prosperous. And that's really not what the Bible has told us today. And these people were out there challenging the Apostle Paul and arguing about who he was. And everybody is trying to say that I too am a good preacher. And most importantly, many of them thought that the Apostle Paul was crazy. So he had a lot of enemies in the church of Corinth telling the whole world that this guy is crazy. Why was that the case? Now, Paul was a person who came to the Lord Jesus Christ very late in his life. He was a Pharisee. He persecuted the Christians. And then, as you know from the book of Acts, that he saw a great vision and Jesus Christ appeared to him and his life turned around 180 degrees. And he, he then, from a person who persecuted Christians, now become a person who preached the gospel till the day he died. And he was beheaded, finally, died a martyr's death. And he became, apart from Jesus Christ, perhaps the most influential writer in the whole of Christianity. And so this kind of 180 degrees turned around, you know. And people look at him and say he must be mad. And the Apostle Paul then addressed this in verse 13. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you, because people accuse us of being beside ourselves. Now, again, in the English language, it's a bit difficult. This we are using the English Standard Version. If you look at other version, New International Version, if we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. The New Living Translation is a little bit even clearer. If it seems that we are crazy. It is to bring glory to God. And if you are in our right mind, it is for your benefit. And if you look at the original Greek, the original Greek used by the Apostle Paul for the word care beside ourselves is exestiman, which means a whole series of things, right? This is why it's important to go to the Greek for preachers because we need to really understand what the rich meaning is before we preach the wrong thing. Greek as a language is very similar to Chinese. Very rich, has many multiple layer of meaning. And here you see, I astonish, I amaze. I am astonished, I am amazed. I am out of my mind, I am mad. So the Apostle Paul was considered as crazy by many people because of the way he lived his life. And Paul says that if you think that I am crazy, it's because I am crazy for God. I want to tell you that this is a very important principle for us and that's why I entitled the sermon today, Crazy. In the Bible, we do see many examples of people who are considered crazy for God. One of the clearest examples would be John the Baptist, Matthew chapter 3, verse 4. Now John the Baptist wore a garment of camel's hair and leather belt around his waist. That doesn't mean he's fashionable. It means that he was in the wilderness and he, he camel's fur probably relate to dead camels, you know, then he just go and cut off the thing and make it into his own garment, leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. So you know, John the Baptist was the prophet that prepared the way for Jesus Christ. The last of the prophet was John the Baptist. And Jesus declared him to be the greatest human being who has ever lived, uh, apart from our Lord Jesus Christ. So he, he was dedicated to the Lord, while he was still in his mother's womb. The only person in the Bible that's declared to be filled with the Holy Spirit from the day he was in his mother's womb. So he prepared the way he baptized Jesus Christ and he led a life that really other people considered to be crazy. He was in a wilderness, he shouted 
out to prepare the way for our Lord Jesus Christ. And people look at him and say he's mad. But not only was he considered crazy, even our Lord Jesus Christ himself was considered crazy. Mark chapter 3, verse 20, after Jesus did his miracles, he became very popular. Everybody came, flocked to him, crowded his hometown. And then Jesus went home and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. And so, Paul was not the only one, certainly, who was considered crazy and out of his mind. And he was a person whom the whole world looked at and think that he should be doing something else. Because, sorry, there's a repeat of the slide. So, there are, there are many people in history, for the sake of God, are considered quite crazy. And some of the nearer-term ex examples for us uh, are people like Dr. John Sung, uh, people who are a little bit older, like my generation, um, even, should be even older, la, but I'm old so. So <laughs> Dr. John Sung was a very unusual person. If you are in a Chinese church, you will all, most certainly have heard of his name, Sung San Jie Bosu. He was famous because he is one of the earliest Christian revivalists that was very popular and very dynamic. So our senior pastor, Dr. Stephen Tong, is often known as the second John Sung. So that type of preaching. Uh, except that in his time, it was even bigger because he was one of the earliest and he was active in the 1920s to the 1930s before the Second World War. Now, John Sung was very unusual because he had a... He came from a, a pastor's family. His father was a kind of a Methodist pastor. And he was sent to New York to study at Union Theological College. And you know, back in those days, it's a very, very rare thing to happen. And he was very brilliant and he got a, a PhD. Uh, I'm sorry, he was sent to the university first, then he went to the seminary later. He got a PhD in chemistry, if I'm not mistaken. And so he went to United States to study and you get a kind of a PhD for a Chinese in the 19. 20s kind of thing. So it's a highly unusual thing. But he decided that he wanted to be a preacher. And so he went to Union Theological Seminary in New York. And then when he was in a seminary, he was all fired for Lord Jesus Christ. So he preached the gospel everywhere he go. He went to the street. Very similar to senior pastor, right? Dr. Seven Tong, Seven Tong at a very young age, 17, 18 years old, he was already on the street preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to anyone. And some of the things he did was he would go and give tuition and he would have money from giving tuition. He used the tuition to buy train ticket. I'm talking about Dr. Tong here. And he would go out on the train and then he would go and preach from car to car to car to car as the train travel one direction and then travel all the way back. He, he did things like that. And John Sung was similar. So he did stuff, things like that. But the seminary he was in, Union Theological Seminary, was a liberal seminary. They don't believe in miracles. They don't believe in the gospel. They only believe in the morality of Jesus Christ. So the principal thought that this guy is mad. He's so fervent. He preached to us. He preached to the... The, the, the janitor, he go preach to the people on the street and they actually confined him to the asylum and this is a mental hospital for a while. And so John Sung was put in a mental hospital for many days during which he read the Bible from cover to cover many, many times. And then when everything was over, he did not graduate from the seminary. He went back in a boat with his PhD and a golden key given to the top student by his university. On the way back to China, John Sung believed that God has called him to abandon all of his life for the glory of God. And he threw all his academic awards into the sea, including the key, including his, his certificate. He only kept one PhD diploma or certificate to show his father that I have done my, I, you know, I have actually graduated with a PhD, although he did not graduate from the seminary. And John Sung is famous for his manic style of preaching. Sadly, there are no actual recording of John Sung's preaching today because uh, he of, of that time, right? And But his style of preaching is considered manic. Uh, those of you who are involved in the biography of Stephen Tong and with me knows that there's one chapter about John Sung. Someone visited John Sung and... This guy was a government officer who was sent to monitor John Sung's preaching because they say a madman has come to town. So we better make sure he don't go crazy. So this guy was sent to monitor his uh, preaching. And because he went to send, watch him preach, end up this fellow became a Christian and later became a preacher also. So it's very, 
very big deal. Like, for example, one of the famous things that John Soon did was when he preaching, he would bring a real-life coffin on stage. Coffin, a real-life coffin. And then he would say in Chinese, fa chai, fa chai, fa guan chai. Uh, then go ask your Chinese-speaking friend what I mean. Guan chai is coffin. Fa chai means being rich. So he say fa chai, fa chai, fa guan chai. And then after that, he would go into the coffin itself. He himself go into the coffin. Now you're talking about 1920, 1930s. You know how, what, how big a taboo it is for that kind of thing to happen. And he preached like a manic person. And a lot of people think that he is crazy. And throughout history, there are many people who are like that. The founder of my Christian charity, Habitat for Humanity, Millard Fuller, loved to tell the story of himself. And he went back with a lot already. And his story is very Korean drama-like, right? By the time he was 30 years old, he was already a multi-millionaire because he worked very hard and he was very brilliant. He could count to the second how much money he was making. And that was his hobby. He said, my hobby is to count per second how much money I'm making. <laughs> and I'm making more and more. But one day when he came home, his wife was packing uh, about to leave him. So he asked his wife, Linda, what happened? And he had a big house with a lake, 10 horses, 10, okay? And then he had a, a power jet boat and all kind of nonsense, all the trappings of, of wealth. And the wife, Linda, looked at him and said, we have money, but we have no love. And then she packed up and she ran, ran away. And he went to chase all over the place for her and found her in New York. He flew a plane all the way to, to look for her because he loved her so much. Uh, and the wife said, no, I'm not going to stick with you anymore. And when he finally found her and cornered her in the hotel, he asked her, so Linda, what do you want? What do you want out of our life? And Linda Fuller told him, I want to rediscover the faith of our childhood. Because these folks live in Georgia, so they, they grew up Christians. And Linda said that, you know, I want to rediscover the faith of our childhood. And so together they prayed and they decided to sell everything they have and serve God from that point onwards. And so they become missionaries to Africa. And Miller Fuller liked to, to tell this story. He said that the first time he went to his pastor and tell the pastor, Pastor, my wife and I had prayed and we decided to sell everything we had. We want to serve God. The pastor said to him, Are you crazy? <laughs> That's the first thing the pastor said. Are you crazy? And Fuller said, I thought that you are a pastor. You always say the wealth is no good, this and blah, blah, blah. So we are doing this, ma. Then the pastor said, yeah, but in life, you must be practical, you know. <laughs> so, Miller Fuller liked to say that he realized that many pastors do not believe in what they preach. They preach one thing, but if you actually do it, they think you are crazy. And so, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, there are many people who do things in life where the rest of the world look at and say that, hey man, you guys are crazy. And that was the case for the Apostle Paul. But I would like to tell you that this seems to be the prescription, actually, not just for famous great servants of God, but for every one of us. For the Jesus Christ, who has been considered crazy, even by his own family members, said this. In John chapter 15, verse 18, If the world hates you, Jesus said, Know that he has hated me before he hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as his own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore... The world hates you. What Jesus Christ was saying is simply this, you know. If the world don't think that you are crazy, something is wrong. Because you are of the world. You are very happy. You are swimming with the world. The world look at you the same with us, ma. You exactly the same. Everything we do, you, you, you do the same. Everything we believe, you believe the same. When I look at you as a follower of Jesus Christ, I don't see anything different. The world look at you that way. And so, yeah, no problem. That's why Jesus said, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. And so a Christian that is really, really loved by the world, something is wrong. That's what Jesus Christ is saying. The world would, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And in verse 20, remember, the word, the word that I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And this teaching and this understanding is consistent in the Bible. The Apostle Paul also wrote, 2 Timothy 3.12, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. This, of course, doesn't mean that we all go out there and act as if we are mad. But it does mean that every single true follower of Jesus Christ will have a certain moment in their life where the world thinks that you are quite crazy. And it really depends on 
to what extent do you f- believe that you want to live the life that God has asked you to live? And of course, it also depends on the environment that you find yourself in. Our senior pastor, Dr. Seven Tong, has always talked about the way God has ordered the world. And we want to encourage you to always think about God's order versus man's order. In the way God has designed the world to be, in terms of priority, Dr. Stephen Tong has thought often that number one must be God. The second priority in life are men, relationship, family, our friends, the people we live in. They are important, you know. And of last importance in life are things. So by the order of God, life should be placed in this priority, that God is number one. And then, apart from God, the people who love us, the people whom we love, are of the second priority. And of the least importance are things. The, your car, your house, your, your wealth, your whatever it is. So this is the correct order of things. However, of course, in man's situation, is the other way around. We put things as the most important, isn't it? We have to gain as much as we can. We work very hard. I mean, people who work very hard, you ask them, why do you work very hard? They work hard either for money, for some kind of security or to gain something and to show that I have achieved that. And we are completely sucked into that kind of culture, isn't it? That we need to have things. We need to wear branded things to show you that I have arrived. My good friend Jack Sim of the World Toilet Organization like to say that any woman who carries a super branded bag is trying to do two things. Number one, to tell you that I can afford this. Number two, to tell you that you cannot afford it. You know, that's the two things. I can afford this. Number two, you cannot afford it. And, and people are so trapped by it, right? Uh, I don't know whether I shared with, with you this before. One of the most horrifying cases that I've handled in marital issue was a wife who had to buy a $28,000 bag, branded bag. And the husband has no money. And so what she did, she went to get credit card to pay for it. She applied for six credit cards, one pay for the next one. She thought she's very clever. I was, ha, huh, excuse me, anybody home? You know. So one pay for another and the, the debt keep rolling until finally people come and knock on the door and the husband discover it and then they clash. So the husband say, you are dishonest. You didn't tell me all these things. And she turned around and looked at him and said, you're useless because you cannot afford to buy me that bag. So why do I marry you? I was not able to save that marriage unhappily. And I was, couldn't understand this. How is it possible, number one, that a bag can cost $28,000? How? Why? I don't... What? Is it Birkin? What? Kin, what? You, you put it in a normal store, I cannot tell the difference, you know? And, but it's important. And I found the answer in one of the documentary shows. So this uh, guy was going around asking all these very expensive shop people, why? So he asked the owner, why is it that your bag is worth $28,000? Why? And the owner of the shop said, if you have to ask that kind of question, you cannot possibly be my customer. Wow. I thought, wow, that's very brilliant, man. If, if I'm a journalist, I say, oh, I'm so ashamed. You know, I cannot, I, I ask the wrong question. I, I, you know, I, I'm so shameful. $28,000, same dollar, no, not rupiah, okay? $28,000. So if you have to ask that question, you cannot be my customer. Go, go to the Kopitiam next door. That's the place for you. you know? So it's, it's a brilliant thing. So a lot of people are trapped by it. Then they put men second. My work is more important. My family comes second. I must sacrifice, ma, you know. I must sacrifice for work, what? For all of you. Right? You're like holiday, right? So daddy has to sacrifice my life so that you get your holiday. Twice a year, we go to wherever there's cold or very nice fly, whatever it is. So your second priority to the things of work. And of course, God is the very last priority. You only come to God when you are desperate, when you find something you cannot solve, whatever, then you crawl to God. The, the Chinese say, 平时不烧香, 临时抱佛脚. That means normally you don't go and burn a joystick. La. Then you panic that time, then you go and grab Buddha's feet. In our case, we grab Jesus' feet. La. Come on, Jesus, help me. Because you are the last priority in my life. Not the first priority. Now, when you think about things like that, you've got to ask yourself the question, so is it depending on me? This kind of order, whatever, is it dependent on me? Because I think that things come first and all that, so it is. The answer is no, because the order of God cannot change. It cannot be that God has ordained that he must come first, relationship comes second, and things come last. 
But when it comes to you, all of a sudden his rule doesn't apply. But the, 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 the problem is that indeed many people think like this. To them, the most natural thing is things must come first. It is said that Rockefeller, the multi-billionaire who has long died, was once asked the question, Mr. Rockefeller, may I know how much money is enough? His answer is very standard. He said, just a little bit more. So no matter how much you have, not enough. How much is enough? Just a little bit more. You know? And honestly, they believe in it. How can that be? The answer is if you are upside down. Isn't it? The order of God as God, number one, relationship, number two, and things, number three, is ordained by God. And it is right. The only way where things can become number one in your life is if you are upside down, not God, because God cannot possibly be upside down. And so, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, such is the way the world is. That much of the world, the vast majority of humanity is upside down. And so to them, when they look at you, you are crazy. You are mad. You, you think of things of God. You're crazy, man, you know. You think that it's, it's better to, to live a simple life. That's crazy. I, I, I must have all these things. We are the one who get it right. And as Jesus Christ said, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ and you get the right order all your life, you will find that your friends look at you and think that you are crazy. You are mad. Why do you give up your life to do things like that? And I will say that this has been the experience I have all my life long. For as long as I'm conscious of this, I have experienced this. That people look at me and say, couldn't you do something better with your life? My late father was one of them. The first time I told him that I'm going to the seminary for seminary study in preparation for full-time ministry, for the first time in my life, I saw him cry. Not tears of joy, you know. He, he, he acted as if I just told him that I got stage 4 cancer or something like that. Because in a Chinese concept, being a preacher means that you will be poor for the rest of your life. Till the day he died, he never understood why I did this. And from time to time, he would tell me that, you know, why, why, what happened to you? <laughs> from time to time, he would ask me that, sort of in his way, what happened to you? That, that's essentially his question, what happened to you? Oh, you look at your brothers, they are so successful. Wow, they got this, they got that. You look at this other un uncle or this cousin or whatever it is. Wow, they... Da, 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 da. In other words, what happened to you? you know? And that has been the way the world is. However because I understood that he is upside down. So I am not perturbed by it. No, I might disturb. I'm not going to cry because my father don't agree with me. No, because I understand this is what the world should be. And I will tell you that such craziness for God is really not just something that is given to John the Baptist or Paul or even a Yong Teng Ming. No, it is something that will come to you when you are closer to God. And it is the case for every single one of us. For some of us, the craziness for God is huge because of the environment you come from. For some of us, it's just the beginning here and there. But be very clear about this. As Jesus Christ said, if no one ever thinks that your thinking processes or your decision or your opinion or the way you live your life is crazy in your entire life, then I tell you something is wrong because then you are swimming with the crowd. But as we become close to God and honest to God, and especially with the enlightenment of His Word, the Holy Spirit will mold your life and change your life so that you come closer and closer to be like Jesus Christ. Remember we were preaching earlier, the, inner, the outer self is wasting away, but the inner self is being renewed. When? Day by day. And it will certainly happen. And it will happen to even the most unexpected person. Yesterday, I summoned in a plumber to my place because we had a concealed pipe leakage. And this is like crazy, right? Uh, we live in a very old apartment, so by now the pipes are all conking out. And it's very troublesome, as some of you know, when a concealed pipe has leakage. So you get in a plumber, and you know plumbers in Singapore are usually the... 
I hate to use the word, pretty asing looking kind of a person, right? They're very rough and tumble and speak Hokkien or Chinese kind of thing. Uh, I, w- I went to the web and, and check it out ma, because I'm an engineer. Wa. I need to use my engineering degree. And, and I, I found that in the United States, they use thermal imaging devices, okay? Uh, Pak Budi is here, so I better don't talk too much. It, it, it's like the thermal imaging devices will tell you where the leakage is, apparently. something Because the pipe has a water, so the temperature is different. So you, you can use that and like x-ray, la, you know. So I asked the plumber you know, over the phone, you know, this thermal is what? He said, this is what thermal is, what thermal So he said, you know, if not, how you know? He said, by experience, la, you know, come. So I already a bit look him know up uh, because I uh, experience. So I went to ask all my engineering friends, civil engineering friends, say, hey, you know, got plumber, got thermal. They all laugh like crazy. Ah, Singapore, no such thing, like, what thermal, what? All this, just call the asking to come in. So this guy came. And so as he was doing his work and trying to find the source, we started talking. And he realized that, hey, you know, this young Temen guy is uh, with Habitat for Humanity. So he asked, do you have presence in Laos, the country Laos? I said, why you ask? He said, because I have a ministry there. I said, huh? <laughs> Plumber guy got a ministry in Laos. I said, where? He said, in the, in the city centre and also in a place called, I can't remember, the name, Apatan or something like that. Very far away. I said, how, very far away, how do you get there? He said, okay, you can fly to Bangkok. From Bangkok, you take a bus. The bus takes 12 hours to reach that village. And a bunch of us have been doing work there. I say a bunch of you doing work there, what does that mean? He say a group of us, la, we, we go down there, we teach the kids English and all. They can speak a bit of English and help them build their house. They are very, very poor and all that. I say, I know they are very poor. I mean, this line, I know exactly what you're talking about. But why did you pick upon whatever it is? 12 hours from Bangkok. I say from Habitat for Humanity's anger, number one, is it near to the airport? Because volunteers don't want to travel more than one hour, they will curse and swear, you know. So whatever poor we help, uh, better be about an hour away from the airport. Uh. Anything beyond that, probably not sustainable, you know. And he said, because the group of us get together, we prayed, and God led us there. And I was like, oh. Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We are reformed evangelical, no? so wow, we all must plan and wow, all the use our brain and think. Our friends say, because God led us there. Why not? I ask you, why not? Is it not possible that God would speak to a plumber and say, go to a place that's 12 hours by bus in the middle of nowhere to help these people? Because without him, who is going to help these people? And then, of course, he went on to talk about all the difficulties he's facing, how he brought a bunch of pastors there, and a bunch of pastors promised the provisional governor that they would change the world. And then coming back to Singapore, all disappeared one by one. Siam ka behu again. And no response to email, no yes, no nothing. That's why he was asking me, are you able to see whether we can do something? My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, when he first said in my mind, the uh, first thing that came to my mind is, you're crazy, man. You're crazy. 12 hours, sit until your back, your butt painful all the way there. If you ask me to deal with it, I will say, okay, number one, use our strategy, la, 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 la. And here you have a person crazy for God because God has spoken to him in his heart to help someone who is in such a remote place. The Apostle Paul start off by talking about how for the fear of God, he has done the work he, he did. And in the closing verses, verse 14 says, the second four, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, and those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. The Apostle Paul was repeating a theme that he used very common in all his writing, that dying for Christ means living for Christ. The other book, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified for Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. What really 
were the motivation of the Apostle Paul to be crazy for God. Verse 11, knowing the fear of the Lord. We already talked about that, and that's very real. So it is true that sometimes we need to think about this, a healthy fear of the Lord. We do what we do because we are accountable for God. But here the Apostle Paul gave the second reason, because of the love of Christ. And I tell you that God's love for us is crazy. In your second responsive reading, I pick for you Romans chapter 5. But God shows his love for us in that while we were all sinners, Christ died for us. Just on this verse alone, the craziness of the love of God is exemplified. That while we are yet sinners, while we are still his enemy, while we still hate him, while we still don't know who he is, while we still are so angry and bitter about our life and whatever it is, and curse at God, he died for us. And that's how crazy the love of God is. The Apostle Paul says that these things compel me to be crazy for God. May I ask you this morning, have you surrendered yourself to the crazy love of God? I have come to realize that spiritual work is less a choice, more a surrender. A choice means that I choose. Let me choose. Let me think for myself. Do I want to do this for God? Do I want to take this part of my life and give it to Him? It's my choice. But I tell you that the Bible does not preach choice. The Bible preaches surrender. Surrender means that because of the crazy love of God for me, I surrender to Him. And I no longer live at the Apostle Paul says, but Christ who lives in me. I know that it's a difficult thing for us, for many of us, but may I encourage you to take it on a step-by-step basis, surrendering yourself more and more to the Holy Spirit to renew your life, that every single day that passes by, you become more and more like Jesus Christ. So much so that one day when people look at you and the choices that you have made in life, they will say that this guy is crazy. And you will say from the bottom of your heart that I'm not the one who is crazy. You are crazy because I am living the life that God has meant for me to live. Let us pray together. We thank you, O God, for the word that we have read. And we do want to ask that you grant to us an enlightenment in our hearts that we will remember that the things that you ordain in the world are unchangeable because of your wisdom. And so if indeed in the world you come first, our relationship comes second and the things of the world come third, that must be the case. But we are far away from you and so we get entrapped by so many confusing issues in life. Help us to surrender ourselves to you because you have loved us so much that you give your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us, to take our place, that we may be reconciled with you. We suppose that we will never ever truly understand what this means, but give us the grace and the faith to accept that you have accepted us. And because of that, we no longer live for ourselves. We've surrendered ourselves totally to you. Help us to look through our life to see what is it that is holding us back from you that we may surrender ourselves totally to the crazy love that you have given to us all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.